Did you know you can support Hugo's Desk in Patreon? Starting as low as $1 per month, your subscription to the channel will give you access to a lot of perks. For example, you can vote in my next video or help me select the next topics of the channel. You'll have access to our growing Hugo's Desk community with a private Discord channel and a private Facebook group. You can even take part of our monthly Q&As and AMAs. By subscribing to my channel and Patreon, you're not only helping me keeping the channel alive, but you can help make Hugo's Desk better, bigger, and with even more content. And now, on to the video. Thank you so much. My name is Zug Guerre and welcome to Hugo's Desk. If you haven't seen the other parts of this video regarding pre-production, on-set filming, CG post-production, then please click on one of these links on the screen. In this section, I'm going to talk about the post-production from a 2D point of view, the importance of stock footage, we'll deconstruct all the keying, roto and pre-composting. So here's the complete scripts for the shot. Uh, as you probably know, I mean, it was a couple of us working on these shots. And of course, we had to split the workload by everyone else. You know, we had, you know, we had one Brookhouse, which was doing the CG. And of course, he was taking care of, you know, these kind of pre-comps that you see here for the actual cloud. So this is an actual pre-comp of the CG, uh, you know, with all the Udini passes and also some some specific things that he did as well. At the same time, we also had the rest of our team, you know, uh, Bjorn and Kurti and Sebastian and Justin, they were working on the pre-comping and doing the keying and also doing some of the rotoscoping. And this is what this script is all about. Last but not least, I was kind of gathering everything at the end. So this is the main script that has everything. It has basically pre-renders from all those specific scripts that I just show you. So it has a pre-render from one and it has a pre-render from the keying. And then last but not least, we have another script, which is the final script, which actually has a lot of pre-comped versions so that we could be quite quick grading. So I decided very early on to grade this shot inside of Nuke because it was so much easier to handle than going to DaVinci with some masks. But we'll talk about that in a minute because there are some requirements. You, you want to kind of think that you, if you want to grade in Nuke, you need to know what you're doing. You know, that means you have to have a proper monitor, a proper calibration, a proper color space, you know, all those things kind of working. Thinking about the actual keying script, uh, it was split by all kinds of different layers. You know, we, we, we first originally had uh, this section here, which as you can see has quite a lot of keying on each section that we had. And we rendered uh, dozens of layers for this shot because we had, we had three troops, uh, like you saw in the shoot, and they had three suits. That means that we could only really uh, photograph them three at a time. So we had to like make a layer with three people, then make another layer with another with the same three people, then make another layer with clean plates, then we make a later layer with the, with them running on other different places, then yet another layer of them running even on different places. So we just like try to maximize as much as we could because we had motion control to actually have all these layers. Now originally we had the main character, which was this one here. This was the main character, the shot, and he was shot with other people. We did decide to remove this dude here and this dude here because that wasn't really working. And, and as you can see here, if I just go backwards, the client wasn't very happy with the performance of, and we were not very happy with his performance. So we ended up replacing him with Thomas Wall from Stiller Studios. But the process of keying him uh, was very similar to the type of way that we usually key. Like, basically, I had a clean plate, which was coming from the, you know, from the motion control, which is always cool. 
to have auto motion control because it just allows you so much more control over over the fine detail of the edges. Then we had kind of our section here with the keyers. We had our garbage masks and some additional rotos. Um, the way that this was kind of handled was that we denoised it first. Uh, back then, I didn't have the wonderful plugin I use these days, which is the Reduce Noise V4. I didn't have it back then, so I, I had to use the denoise uh, bundled with Nuke. But as you can see, the denoiser was not meant to affect the actual image. Uh, we were just after trying to denoise some of the really nasty artifacts we had, especially on the blue channel. If you, if you look at... Um, if you look at this here, uh, you can kind of see that we had some really nasty, uh, sharp artifacts coming from the red footage. So we, we denoised it so we could have the best quality possible on the key. Another thing as well that I want to mention, and this is very common, I, I tend to work this way. I know a lot of people don't. I prefer to roto in key with the original plate. So this is untouched, unscaled. We shot it at 6K back then in 2015. That was the maximum the red camera could handle. So then we key that, that resolution. And I know it might sound silly, but it doesn't really. Like, the more resolution you have, the better you can have in terms of details of filtering, and especially details on the hair. And not that they have hair, but at least you have more details on the edges. So I kind of advise that. I prefer to use the raw footage, the raw data, and then kind of try to pull the best key I can. We denoised both the clean plate and also the plate. This, of course, was just for the key, so I'm going to switch to alpha channels to show you. We first had a primate. This primate was quite rough, uh, basically picking uh, the actual color for the background, and we were just aiming for the color near him. Of course, after adjusting a few things, uh, we ended up eroding it a little bit and also blurring it a little bit. Um, on the other side, we had the clean plate and also the same denoise plate, and we used an IBK keyer gizmo. Uh, the IBK keyer gizmo uh, gave us a better fin control of the edges. Of course, it gave us a lot of grain, and that's why we have a grade node here. This grade node is literally just tweaking the black point, and that's just the darkest areas of the image. Could have also been used with the color corrector, but as you can see, we have a much better uh, edge here, but of course we have a lot of holes to fill. I'm just lowering the gamma here so you can see it here. So once that's done, that then goes into an erode here. It g gets graded as well, so we have an inner mask here, so that it's actually really thick. Um, that gets channel uh, merged with the actual original key, uh, so we can stencil out the rest of the stuff. We it a little bit, blurred it a little bit, and then channel merged it again with the result of the IBK keyer to fill up some of those holes and keep some of the edges. Then uh, this is actually not being used anymore. It was a roto just to adjust, and then we finally do a pre molt And this is now the raw key. Now, of course, you still see the edges, and you still see kind of the uh, green spill. And that's not a big deal. Like, I, I tend to prefer... You know, this, this is not a real key workshop. You know, you know, normally you would key different areas of the body. So you would have a keyer for the head, a keyer for the middle ground, and a keyer for the bottom, depending on how much the green screen changes. And it does fluctuate quite a lot. If you look at here, there's a huge difference of green here to there, to there, and to there. So eventually you would have created multiple keys. The difference is here that we don't have any hair, and he doesn't really have any straight collars. It's quite easy to key this because he is literally a single collar. He's very monochromatic. As you can see here from the red channel, green and blue, he's, he's so monochromatic that you can literally do a Luma key almost. So we ended up, and, and also I, I do prefer to handle these things like the edges and, and the sp spill suppression, I prefer to handle it in the main comp. I don't like this idea of handling it here because you kind of want to do additive keyers. You kind of want to handle it in the main comp, you know? And when I go into the main comp, you'll see what I mean. Like, if I just show you here really quickly, you can clearly see that in here on the main uh, footage, we then do a lot of treatment uh, in terms of uh, color correction and edges to try to fix some of the edges. And I'll show you that in a minute, of course. That's not... Uh, I'm still only on the keying uh, script. Then after that, we, we had some garbage masks. So these are just garbage masks for the outer soldier. And then we have um, garbage masks that get merged. Now, this means that this way we get rid of everything else around him, especially the other soldiers, because we do have another soldier on the corner here. But we don't want to have this dude, the top light, or this dude here. So we ended up rotating 
by using a garbage mask to kind of get rid of uh, some of those areas. And also, of course, garbage masks for the other soldier that was on the side here. That all gets channel merged, of course. And we also have a channel merge here to remove the shadow areas, the contact of the feet, which, uh, as you can see here, it's basically just fixing those problems. And then last but not least, we just have a channel merge just to fix some of these holes that we had on the mat, um, which especially the radio here that is picking up uh, and also a lot of bad details that we have here on the inner mask on the details here as well. Now, there's a lot of ways to do a king. This was just one of the ways. Um, then we didn't really do this, this bill here. We ended up going here, um, as you can see, and then we basically um, have the pre-molted. Now, the way that I usually tend to work is that I have a stream which has all the green screen, and then I copy in the alpha, um, and then basically we just basically put a pre-molt here so that we can kind of try to see how it looks. Uh, then, finally, I reformatted to 2.5K. The reason that we did 2.5K was because of the CG, really. So we decided the client only needed HD. We decided to deliver 2.5K in YouTube because back then YouTube wasn't very common to have 4K, but it also wasn't common to just use HD. So we did the intermediate resolution, which was 2560 by 1080. That was, of course, the 245 aspect ratio of this resolution. And then finally, when this is actually here, um, and to be honest, like I should have put like a log to lin here um, before I reformatted it so extremely. And that's an advice I would give you guys to first log to lin, then reformat, and then log to lin again. Um, I didn't do that back then. I think it was just an omission. We prob I probably forgot, um, but you know, this is live script, but at least now you know. I used the cubicle filter. That was kind of the filter that worked best for this project um, to kind of match the CG. This is, of course, the main character. Of course, we did exactly the same kind of processes for all everyone else. So we have here these, these dudes here. Uh, now, we separated them one by one. And now, one last mention I want to say is for these crop boxes here. These crop boxes are actually very useful and they are animated. The reason I animate them is because if you don't put a crop box like this, you'll see exactly what I mean. If I disable this crop box on these layers, so if I if I go here and I process this plate, you can kind of see that I'm getting very weak performance. Uh, I'm getting about a one frame per second and that's because he's processing the entire image. He's not actually uh, only processing this part, which is the only thing I need. So I animated some crop boxes so we can get a better performance. And as you can see, now with the crop box, you get three frames per second. So that's literally three times more uh, performance than what we had before. I know it doesn't sound much, but if you start having 20 layers, all these performance hits will really make a huge dent in your render. You know, like your render might take three hours instead of one hour because it is literally three times more. And especially because we have here, tw like we have 12 layers. And so if you have 12 layers times three of rendering, you could end up with like several hours of rendering instead of just a few minutes. So that's kind of it. Like we, we do this to every single one of them. We have all the different uh, layers here. So we, as you can see here, we have this dude, we have this dude here. I'm just going to go to the end here so it's a bit easier to see. We have this dude here as well, which is on the side here. He's running. Then we have even more people. Uh, I think it's probably earlier that he runs in. Uh, some layers you have to kind of scrub a bit so you can see them. We also have this dude here. We have also that dude there. And we also have this dude here. And, and it just goes on and on. All of them were kind of keyed on the kind of the same way. Uh, you kind of want to always try to do a core mask. There's uh, some unplugged things here. Uh, you kind of want to always do a core mask, a garbage mask, and then kind of do fine tuning on the air edge. Very basic 101 keying. Uh, but then again, these guys were pretty easy to key, so we didn't really went too deep on them. Uh, and as you can see, these are all the layers. Uh, ultimately, we ended up replacing him with some new layers. We as you saw on the on the keynote, we ended up shooting, you know, months later, Thomas Wall from Seller Studios on the shot. And he was, of course, then re-keyed and we did the keying. Now, one last mention, this was keyed the same way. We used the key light, uh, but it was the same kind of process. Garbage mask, inner mask, core mat. Um, I will eventually do a, key, a, a, a tutorial about keying. I really need to do that. It's been a while. Uh, we also removed the tracking markers here. There was one extra thing we had to do here, which was using some basic 
um, uh, masks and transformations to basically patch up every single one of these uh, tracking markers we had on the gun. And then, of course, we had the logo from the client. Uh, the logo was this Apex logo. It was actually quite clean. And as you can see, we use um, we basically use this mask here, like a scratch mask to actually mask out uh, the logo. And then the logo kind of looks a bit more dirty. And then, of course, we had the corner pinner, the transform, the match move. The match move, of course, was coming from the actual track of the gun. So if that, of course, gets merged on top as well on the logo. Now, because we were still we were still comping the logo, I wanted to have it as a layer. And that's why I have a shuffle here. We then have the alpha channel of him, which is the precessed keyed alpha channel. And then we have the logo itself. The logo is a separate layer and then it gets rendered. It all gets rendered. Uh, with the reformat um, and the auto crop box as well. And it gets ref reformatted as an EXR with multiple EXRs. So all in all, this is kind of how the keying script worked. Like I said, it's very common that you separate work, especially if you're working in a big company and especially if you have a big project like this. And so we decided very early on to have a comp script, a final grade script, and also roto script, and also a pre-comp 3D script. And of course, this is 6K and 2.5K. You kind of want to pre-render a lot of things. You kind of want to pre-comp a lot of things. So it's that's why. So that's kind of like the, the, um, the rundown of the keying script. I'm going to close the keying script now and just move on to the other scripts we have. Before I go into the final comp, I also want to show you the pre-comp made by CG. Now, last time we saw, last video, we saw the renders from Houdini. And as you can see, these are actually the renders that were outputted from Houdini. So we have the, this was rendered uh, by Houdini, of course. Different layers, we, we talked about that before, but we have the main smoke uh, pyro layer. Then we have the actual mushroom layer. Um, and then we have, of course, the bottom smoke and more bottom smoke to actually render it. Now, this was the script from Juan Brockhaus. He really loves to use these uh, these node inputs. <laughs> and one of the things we did was we retimed the scene. So it was very difficult to render this CG in Udini, especially because we were only using uh, Juan's machine. So we only had one machine to render this render. We talk about the specs before you can go back into the last video and check that. But so just like it says here, one is very organized. So we always write here. So only every second frame is rendered. So we basically for Mudini, he decided to render only every second frame. So since only sec since only every second frame is rendered, make the sequence twice as quick and then offset the start to the new frame. So you basically make it twice as quick so because you're only rendering every other frame so you can get a full sequence. And then you put a Cronus on top and the Cronus goes back to the original slow motion we wanted. And basically this Cronus is setting it to 0.25. We, of course, will end up with a lot of artifacts because the method is a motion method, but the artifacts actually help us quite a lot, especially in the, in the fire here. The more artifacts you have, the more it kind of looks like an explosion. So that really worked for us. You know, I actually this technique of only rendering uh, one, uh, only render um, every second frame was was brilliant. Um, but that's one. One is always brilliant on these things. So uh, if you guys should really check out the work that one Brockhaus does, he's, he's very, very good. So this is the result of the full render. Of course, you can hardly see it because uh, when it's playback, it's very slow, but you can kind of see it slowly moves. Then we did exactly the same thing uh, to the inner explosion as well by retiming it and doing a Cronus on it. And that basically gave you the speed that we were after, which was an hyper slow motion. So as you can see, very subtle movement, but exactly the movement that we were after. It's actually quite cool. And again, the artifacts of retiming really helped the shot because it makes it almost look like it's morphing and then it's, it's it's almost like lava like molten lava which is great it really really worked really well from there uh this was of course merged um it was basically merged on top of each other and then there was a key mix um basically what one made was that he picked up the original mushroom in area he did a key to just have some areas of the mushroom available. And then by using a key mix and a mask, he basically uh, added certain parts of the mushroom. Then he used another key mix with the roto, especially the top area, so that you can actually have the rest of the key of the mushroom. So you see we have this mushroom, 
that mushroom. Once we go here, it basically gets merged on top, then it gets key mixed with little pieces down here on the side, and then it gets key mixed on the top. So you basically get a merging of the two. It's almost like merging two different renders of the mushroom. So then that gets un un pre multiplied. There's a, a lazy tone map here that basically just tone maps the image and reduces some of the highlights a bit, gets key mixed with the ramp so that we actually have less exposure on one of the sides. Gets a bit color corrected, less saturation, especially on the on the color correction, specifically on the main gain of the master. A bit of a U correct just to set the correction. Uh, the U correct is actually happening on the red channel. Uh, then, last but not least, we have this thing here. Uh, so this is just basically um, a piece of um, piece of stock footage. It's a, so this is from Heartbeats uh, Ultra Fire. Gets retimed. Uh, gets merged in so that it has just has the middle section, gets transformed and made it much, much tinier, and it gets merged on top. It's just on the top here, and this is just a little detail just to get it to look like it's more alive. You see, you just get this extra layer of fire on top, which is quite cool. Then there, uh, we have yet another piece of stock. This is a piece of smoke that was retimed. Uh, we're all big fans of stock footage, as you guys know. It has a bit of a displacement applied to it. So this is a glass displacement. Um, the glass displacement is a note from Wikipedia. I really recommend you to use this glass displacement. Uh, we basically use the noise pattern, uh, blurred it a bit, use the glass displacement just to make the smoke look more like smoke, really. It makes makes it look more like it's a wispy smoke um, instead of a soft smoke. Then that get, this gets merged with some color correction, some heavy color correction to get it look like more red, especially redder on the bottom area. And then some extra color correction to look at like it's fire. That all gets merged up. It all gets maxed out with a glow using a blur. Gets, of course, transformed into place, which is the top area. Gets rotoscoped a little bit, gets screened on top with more, exactly one more. So on this side, exactly the same thing. We have a retimed um, stock footage, then gets denoised with a glass displacement, gets color corrected, color corrected. So this is basically a lift in again, getting color correction, going a color correction to actually desaturated, a bit of contrast and less gamma, gets maxed in pre-multiplied, and then it gets blurred with the glow, transformed and rotoed, and get merged with the other one that was already made. Then it gets merged on top, and basically you get this. You get, like, a really hot explosion on the top, and that's completely done by using, like I said, these two elements. Now, these two elements are not just uh, layers, but they're also eye distorted by, by the red and green channel of the actual explosion with a blur. And that gives you just a feeling that is actually placed here. And then it gets merged on top. And again, just gives it a bit more life. Then we have more stuff. We have this piece of debris. This piece of, this piece of stock footage basically is literally just some smoke. Um, gets mirrored, graded, uh, gets sharpened as well gets transformed, uh, graded and clamped, blurred, and then masked into the shot. So it basically just kills the edges so that it doesn't look like it's so an, so even. Then it gets graded with um, a ramp. So basically there's a radial uh, mask here because the inner explosion was very dark. So it was just like lifted up so we can get this kind of light going on here. Then it gets even more lit up by another radial on the lower section. This is, as you guys, people that followed my channel, you know very well that I tend to, you know, we all tend to, both me and one, uh, tend to do a lot of compositing on top of the CG. It's a great way, instead of actually going to 3D and, and changing all these things. This finally gets pre-multiplied, so this is now our new fire. Just to give you an, an idea of how it used to look, you know, this is how it looked originally. So if I merge them both, that's how the fire looks like. Um, after it gets dissolved, it gets a bit nicer because it's merged between... Then it's even better with some kind of um, color correction, of course. Gets even better with some layering of some stock footage of fire in the middle. Gets even better with a lot of fire on the top with some displacement. And, of course, then 
some cutting of the edges, some extra color correction, and voila, that is our new explosion. A lot of work done in comp instead of having to go back to Houdini to do all those things. Then we have even more elements. This is basically another element of, uh, of a smoke. Uh, gets graded, denoised, and eye distorted. Um, the eye distortion is happening from a blurred version of a noise. So a noise pattern gets blurred, goes into the channel of forward, and it gets distorted on top. Then this goes in, and it gives you just these kind of like uh, smoky things that go in. This is the same deal here. We pick up the mushroom, blur it, crop it, use it as a displacement layer with a copy node. I distort it to get this kind of stuff. So we get these kind of fringes of, of lines of smoke, gets blurred a little bit, and then it gets merged on top. And this literally just gives you this sense that the explosion has lifted up so much, and now you have some kind of smoky effects coming down. It's very common if you look at stock footage of explosions of nuclear explosions. You kind of see always these debris coming down. Uh, and again, this was all done just by using a, a piece of stock footage smoke. Never underestimate the power of stock footage. With a lot of love and a lot of compositing, a lot of displacements and blurs and rotos, you can get you know, stock footage to look amazing and sometimes even better than CG. So as you can see here, we have like, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of smoky feeling. Um, now this all goes in, gets merged on that side, like I said, um, and then of course we get merged on the other side. So now we have in this side and that side, and it just gives it that feel of momentum magnitude because you get all these kind of smoky things coming down your way. Even more now here, so this is the same kind of deal. You can see it's another side here, but basically it's the top area. So if you think about it of a big mushroom on the top there, um, so it's done the same kind of way. We have the smoke uh, stock footage, gets retimed, it gets gribbed warped, so it's actually on the top uh, using a grid warp. It gets a bit graded, there's uh, some more atmospherics happening here on this side. That gets retimed as well, that gets transformed as well. And basically, we screen that on top, and now we have the kind of atmospheric layer on top there. Um, then that gets merged and, and cut. We color correct it a little bit, transformed. Again, use the original footage as the layer of distortion, as a red-green forward UV. Distort that so that we get the, the smoke to be distorted, a bit blurred gets merged on top, and now we have like an atmospheric, almost like a um, top fog for the cloud, and of course a crop box, because merging all of this made the bounding box go to almost 3k. And then basically, we now have here the rest of the smoke on the side. So this is the final, um, uh, well, the, the pre-comped uh, mushroom. And now let's go to this side here and talk about um, the actual a smoke ring, which is the bottom area here. So the smoke was again coming from Odini, and um, same kind of deal really. We again rendered, one Brockhaus rendered it, he rendered it a bit faster as well, and then we basically slowed it down. So this is the main layer of smoke particles, uh, the simulation system, uh, very very nice simulation system, especially with the top smoke here. Almost looks like this kind of mushroom coming towards us. Then there's a second one, which is a bit more fluid. So we have like a smoky one, a wispy one, and a less wispy one. They basically get uh, slowed down. Uh, they are slowed down on the same speed as you saw before. They get also time offset, of course, so they can fit the sequence. Once you see them at that kind of speed, they, as you can see, they get really slowed down. And again, the slow motion and the artifacting of the motion-based um, uh, interpolation really helps the render because it makes it look more realistic, makes it look more like a fluid pyro cloud of smoke. They get merged together, uh, basically using a bit of a roto shape on one of the sides. Um, Basically, you put in with one with the roto and then the merge, and so that means that using both sections of the smoke. Then there's the other side, so it gets merged even on another side as well, so we are basically using it three times to make the pyro class cloud bigger. It gets transformed a little bit. 
unpremultiplied for color correction, gets color corrected, uh, color correction, very simple gain um, tinting, uh, some color correction on the bottom here because the nuclear explosion is supposed to be there, so it's a bit uh, less. Um. Uh, then it gets pre-multiplied with the original alpha channel. Um, then we move on here, basically have the the actual mushroom with the smoke on top then it gets merged on top um they get merged both of them there's a copy of an alpha channel from this area here gets an edge blur this edge blur is basically just edge blurring only the smoke then there's a light trap as well the light trap is between the smoke and the the, the atomic bomb just gives it a little less a little better integration on this side here uh, then there's a cut basically a roto shape uh, to cut the bottom area of the scene and that gets rendered so this was the actual render uh, that went to nuke and uh, so if i go back to the comp here i can show you exactly what i mean so that's the actual render that's the pre-comp pre-comp 8 and this is the final explosion. As you can see, we have the cloud on the foreground. Of course, this will be cut by the CG. They are a merge of three renders. So basically, we well, two renders. The middle section is one of the renders. Then this side is the same render with the time offset. And that side is the other render. Then we have the main nuclear explosion, which is two different Udini explosions. Then we have some... As you can see here, this fire that is going on on the top here is literally a piece of stock footage repeated with some displacement. And then we have all these kind of smoke uh, layers that come out of the explosion and come down uh, vertically to the floor. I think one Brookhouse did an amazing job with this explosion and this pre-comp as well. Um, so kudos to him. He is an amazing composter. So. Please don't forget to leave a comment. I would love to know what you think about these videos. And of course, let us know how you did your shots. Our community thrives by sharing knowledge. So we're all so eager to know how you achieve your complicated visual effects shot. Hope you've enjoyed these videos. Thank you so much and I'll see you around. Goodbye.